Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. Android 16 is around the corner and slowly becomes more and more available across Android devices. So what would be a better time than right now to go over what exactly you have to change for your Android app to fully support Android 16 and the new kind of features or functionalities that it enforces. So I will keep myself short in this video but give you a clear migration checklist also with brief details about how certain steps would need to be implemented in your app. So at the end of the video, you clearly know, okay, for my particular app, these are the three things that I definitely have to change to a fully support Android 16. And what definitely every single app needs to do and needs to start with is of course bumping the SDK levels. In Android that works by going to a Gradle, a build at Gradle app, and then you need to make sure that both your compile SDK and target SDK are simply set to 36, which corresponds to Android 16. Then the next and probably biggest crucial change in Android 16 is that you can't opt out of edge-to-edge -edge enforcement anymore. So in case you're not aware, edge-to-edge -edge is in the end the feature that makes your Android app occupy the entire space of your screen, which in the end also makes system components like the status bar, the navigation bar, overlap over content, over UI of your Android app. So what you have to do is you have to take care of that and make sure that no crucial UI elements are overlapped by the system component. In Jetpack Compose, dealing with that is pretty easy by just wrapping your UI into scaffolds and then making use of this inner padding, which already adds the necessary paddings to your UI that actually contains the interactable UI elements while considering the status and navigation bar. If your device is in landscape mode, then you may also need to consider so-called display cutouts, so the hardware camera uh, that could also overlap certain UI elements. But I already went over all of that in detail in a dedicated edge-to-edge -edge enforcement video. I will link it somewhere up here. The next big change is that predictive back gestures are now enabled by default. So those are the new kind of back gestures, back type of navigation where the user already gets a little bit of a preview when they uh, perform, when they at least swipe with a back gesture of where this back gesture will lead them. So they can decide, hey, do I really want to apply or commit this gesture or do I rather want to stay in the current screen? And for normal back navigations, that already works out of the box. But if you have certain custom back behavior, so you maybe close some kind of dialogue or so, then you have to stick to the new predictive back gestures that works and compose with the predictive back handler in which you get this uh, flow here of back events that lets you observe all kinds of behavior about the current gesture offset. So you can possibly also create some kind of a custom animation for your UI that in the end previews a little bit for the user of what would happen when they proceed with that gesture. If you're using XML and views in your app, then you need to stick to the on back invoked callback for such custom back handling uh, gestures because these older on back pressed APIs are deprecated. In Android 16, you can still temporarily opt out of predictive back gestures by setting a flag in your uh, manifest file so that these predictive back gestures don't apply to your app and you would not have to migrate just now. But sooner or later, this will be enforced and you will have to migrate. So if you have a little bit of time, it makes sense to do this now, especially because users of Android 16 will see this behavior in other apps and then also kind of expect it in yours. Next change that probably doesn't affect that many people, but the elegant text height attribute for text views has been deprecated. So that was in the end a text view property that could turn off the font compacting optimizations for certain languages that had some uh, tall glyphs like Thai, Arabic and so on. So there's some specific languages that have very tall glyphs where you may have uh, turned on this um, optimization with this elegant text set attribute. This is now deprecated. So in case your app supports some of these languages and you have used this attribute, then migrate away from it. The next change affects the scheduled executor service, which is an older API in the end uh, used to schedule background events, background tasks in your app. And the schedule at fixed rate function from that scheduled executor service now only delivers at most one execution, one task upon process start. So before Android 16, if your app was killed, for example, via process death, and there were still multiple and non-executed tasks from the scheduled executor service, then the moment your app is relaunched after the process death, all of these tasks were ran by the scheduled executor service. However, now on Android 16, only one task of these possibly multiple missed tasks will run at most. And according to Google, this is to prevent performance issues. Sounds like a big deal, but in the end, this is, uh, as I said, a rather old API. And nowadays I would suggest using an API like Work Manager in the first place, which helps you to schedule tasks that should really run reliably. 
And Wolf Manager also doesn't have that limitation. Another big change that affects all of you who have been too lazy to support proper state restoration across configuration changes. From Android 16 onwards, what Android will enforce is if you try to lock your device's orientation, for example, just to portrait mode, which was possible with a manifest flag, then this enforcement won't be enforced by the OS anymore. So even if you say, hey, I just want my app to support portrait mode, then the OS comes ahead and says, no, uh, I will actually let the user rotate because Google is really pushing this uh, overall responsive layout, building tons of adaptive UI for millions of screens. So you now don't get around making your UI support multiple screen sizes, orientations, foldables and whatnot, because you can't opt out of that anymore. There are some exceptions for this rule. So on the one hand, if you have a game, for example, you can opt out of that because it would be uh, quite weird if you have a game that can only be played in landscape mode to accidentally keep on rotating it and lead to some kind of a weird view or so. So games can be opted out. Uh, if your users actually say, hey, I explicitly want the app's default behavior for locking it into portrait mode, then users can opt into that, but that is something they would have to uh, actually do. And for screens that are simply smaller than 600 dp, uh, for these, it will also not be enforced. So for example, normal phones, normal mobile devices, that are definitely not 600 dp wide. If you say in your manifest, please log in portrait mode, then this will be enforced for your mobile devices, but not, for example, if your app runs on a tablet. Two more changes, and the next one is affecting all health-related apps, uh, especially if you are working together with Wear OS devices, so and, uh, Google's smartwatch, because the permissions to actually read relevant health data, like the user's heart rate, these became a bit more granular. So previously, there was just uh, one permission called uh, body sensors or so, and you could read all kinds of body sensors information from the user. But now Google replaced these on Android 16 with more granular permissions. For example, read heart rate as a new permission that lets you really just read the user's heart rate. And also something that is required on Android 16, if you collect such health data from users, you need to display an in-app privacy policy for that. Otherwise, uh, your app won't be approved in Google Play. And lastly, that affects all of you who have some kind of Bluetooth behavior in their apps. Because the way how you actually detected bond loss, so if a paired device is actually not paired anymore, that has changed a little bit. For that, there is a new intent that your app can receive, uh, which the OS simply sends the moment the uh, previously paired device isn't paired anymore. That intent has the action, action key missing. And there's also a separate intent with the action, action encryption change, which shares information with you when something about Bluetooth related encryption changes. So if your app actually needs to react to these kinds of behaviors or changes, then make sure to migrate to these new intents that the OS will send. Down below, you find Android Premium courses, which really teach you Android and Kotlin multi-platform from the ground up. So check these out if that's something you want to get better in. And otherwise, I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.